So I'm going to be talking about this uh, preprint that I have about a project with Jerome Kelleher, Kevin Thornton, Jamie Ashander. Um, and it's on the bioarchive uh, slide. How about I'll say next when we go to the next slide. Okay, um, okay so um, if you refresh, you might get an actual link to the slides there, Dennis. Um, okay. Um, so uh, you, you can follow along. The slides themselves are in my GitHub repository, ft prime underscore ms, uh, in the subdirectory docs. Um, so uh, in this talk, um, uh, this paper is kind of t dealing with two things. One is telling you about um, sort of methods for storing and working with tree sequences, uh, which I'll, I'll explain. And then uh, there one particular application, which is um, how to use them to speed up for its time individual-based population genetic simulations. Okay, and so uh, the way this project happened was that I've been wanting to do kind of the second thing for a long time. And it turned out that the file formats, the, the data format that Jerome Kelleher came up with for his coalescence simulator MS Prime was you know, just the right thing to make this actually happen. Okay, slide. Uh, and then down, hit down. Um, you can use the arrow keys. Okay, so um, as you know, if you have a collection of genomes, right, if you look at any position on the genome, then, then there is some some tree, some genealogical tree that says how those genomes are related to each other. And as you move along the genome, you get a, a sequence of trees, okay? So here, this animated GIF is showing you the, the sequence of trees going along a chromosome from a, a, a simulation of 30 individuals. Okay, um, down. So this, that, that's the, uh, go down again, Yes, okay, so um, a tree sequence is de describing that sequence of trees. Um, so this slide is about terminology. Um, the pedigree is what you would have if you knew for everybody out there who their parents were. And to reconstruct these trees, you need a bit more. You need where the recombinations were, okay? So the pedigree plus crossing over locations would give us the tree sequence, but for everybody ever, Right? And that's clearly like more than we generally need. And if you're just interested in the history of a particular subset, like a, your, your sampled genome, say, then um, <clears throat> you need less of that information. So that information, uh, either of those things is a tree sequence, but that uh, smaller amount of in information is what's encoded in the ancestral recombination graph or ARG. Okay, uh, next. Um, no, no, go back. Now hit down. Yeah, sorry. <clears throat> I apologize for the technical difficulties. Um, all right, so the basic tool here, the tree sequence data structure was um, developed by Jerome Kelleher for this simulator MS Prime, uh, along with Allison Etheridge and Gil McPhee. Uh, it stores genealogical and genetic variation data extremely compactly. And the way it's set up, it, it lets you compute stuff extremely efficiently, like do things like subset out a set of samples, compute allele frequencies, LD, uh, do haplotype matching, all basically in log time in the number of, of individuals. And the reason it's so compact and efficient to work with is that it's basically, you could think of it as a compression scheme um, that's like similar to um, uh, some sort of, sort of haplotype matching scheme. And it, but it's using the, you know, the very trees that generated the data to do this compression. Okay, down. Um, all right, so to motivate you, here's um, a quick um, experiment um, where we simulated up uh, a bunch of chromosomes that look like chromosome one, human chromosome one. Um, 
varying numbers between 1,000 and 10 million, and, and then plotting the amount of disk space that you need to store that in the tree sequence format. As you can see, it goes up only slightly faster than log of the number of chromosomes. So with 1,000 of them, you need like 100 megs. And with 10 million, you still only need like 1.2 gigs. Uh, so with 10 million samples here, there's like 17 million variants. If you stored the same thing in a VCF, it'd take like 250,000 times as much disk space. Uh, even just reading that in would take forever. Okay, down. Um, okay, so now I want to tell you like the nuts and bolts of, of how this works. Um, <clears throat> this is a quick example and I'm going to step through it, but just to orient you. Uh, this is going to be a tree sequence describing how three individuals, these individuals 0, 1, and 2, are related to each other across a chromosome of length 10. There was one ancestral recombination event, so there's two trees. They're shown on the left there. Notice the colors on the bottom are different. Um, so there's two trees, there's been three mutations at two distinct sites, and all this information we're storing in these four tables, a node table, an edge table, a site table, and mutation table. Okay, next. Um, and hit down again. Uh, okay, so um, these tables are laid out, you'll see, to be uh, succinct, so without uh, redundancy, like we're not st storing the same piece of information in more than one place. And uh, there's a text interface, but of course in practice it's stored in binary, uh, binary format. Okay, down. Um, so first we're going to look at the node table and the edge table, because those are the things that encode the, uh, the tree topologies. So edges, you know, are, are basically edges and trees, but that they represent uh, inheritance events. Um, so the thing you need to record there is um, who inherits from who, so the parent node and the child node, and then the genomic interval over which they inherit, so the uh, left and the right endpoints of that. Okay, and then those nodes, the parent and the child, are indexing into this other table, the node table, and in that table, uh, for our purposes here, the only thing we need to know is the time, so how long ago the corresponding individual was born, because that tells us the height of the node and the tree. Okay, and uh, sort of oh, one more small note that um, minimally, the, you only need to record these edges for um, inheritances that correspond to coalescent events, it turns out. Okay, next. Uh, Okay, so um, we're going to start out here stepping through these uh, tables. Um, look at the node table and got these three individuals, year one and two, that live in the present day. And uh, next, um, we look at the first edge and see that uh, number one has inherited the entire chromosome from number three. Okay, next. So it turns out that number three, oh, uh, right, and number three lived one unit of time ago, and turns out number three also inherited the entire chromosome from number four that lived two units of time ago. So, so far we've just got one tree here. Okay, next. So the next edge only extends halfway up the chromosome, and from it we learn that zero inherited from three on the left end, the left half of the chromosome. So now we know there's at least two trees, and I'm just, I've split these out. Okay, next. Then we learn that two inherited from four on that left half of the chromosome, and that's completed the first tree in the tree sequence. Next. Now this edge goes from position five to position 10, and we know that it tells us that two inherited from three, and the next one tells us that zero inherited from four. So that specifies all the trees. So here in this example, we've been sort of constructing all the trees at once. But in practice, what you do is you'd first just construct, take all the edges that started at position zero, construct the leftmost tree, and then iterate through the trees by, you know, removing each edge that ends and adding each edge that begins. So that lets you, because it's naturally encoding tree differences, allows you to extremely efficiently iterate uh, through the trees. Okay, um, 
Next slide. Uh, so um, next, so that gives us all the trees. And that's a nice thing to have, but you know, really we have genome sequence. And that gets encoded here in the sites and mutations tables. So a mutation tells us when there's been a mutation on the tree somewhere. So to do to from that we need to know where on the genome it occurred, so at which site, um, what node it occurred in, like ancestrally to, and what the resulting derived state was. And the sites there are indexes into the site table. And the site table records for each potentially variable site um, where on the genome the mutation occurred and what the ancestral state of that position was. Okay, so let's go to the uh, example next. Um, so here we've got two potentially variable sites, sites zero and one, and the ancestral states were A and G. And then next, the first mutation um, happened at site zero, so that's in the left tree, above node two, and resulted in a T. And then the next mutation um, happened at the other site, which is in the right-hand tree, and that occurred on the branch above node three and resulted in a C. And then there's one more mutation that uh, happened at the same site on the branch above node one and resulted in a G. So next, uh, this is now enough to tell us what the genotypes are for everybody at these two variant sites. Okay, so um, that is a step through example of <clears throat> how the information is stored in these four tables. Um, so could you hit right now, Dennis? Okay, so now I'm gonna quickly motivate why you'd want to, why you need to do forward simulation. So could you hit down three times? All right, so um, I maybe don't need to do this, but um, <clears throat> so coalescent simulations are much faster than a, an individual based forward time simulation because they don't keep track of everybody. Right, you, you, it's this neat, uh, it's this beautiful duality result that, that it, it's sufficient to just go back up through the trees and only basically touch the individuals that are ancestral to your sample, okay? But the math that makes that work, turns out, is, is broken by some inconvenient realities of biology like selection and sufficient geographic structure. Uh, next. So this means if you have selection or geography, basically, then you really need to do forward time individual-based simulations to, to, um, to do a simulation. Okay, so hit down uh, three times. And uh, I can't, so sorry about the timing on my jokes here, but oh well. <laughs> um, so, you know, we want to do forward time simulation and we want to do forward time simulation with entire genomes and that, but genomes are big and that's kind of a bummer. Okay. Um, so could you hit right now, Dennis? Uh, right. Thank you. Okay. Uh, okay. So, and again, down. Oh. Uh, yeah. Yes. And hit it once more. Okay, so, so the idea here is that if we record the entire tree sequence that relates everybody to everybody else in the, in the, the process of your forward time simulation, then like after we're done, then we can deal with the neutral mutations. And the reason this is, is because a neutral mutation, you know, by definition doesn't depend, doesn't affect the, the demography, the genealogy. So this process, if you do it right, is, is completely equivalent to having put them in during the simulation as you went along, all right? And, and re removes the burden from your simulator of, of tracking all these neutral variants. Okay, so uh, could you hit down twice? So, um, but it's totally not clear this is a good idea because you're gonna have to record the entire history of everybody like ever. Okay, so hit down. Um, <clears throat> so, but 
but, but let's just like talk through how this would work. So to, to make this work, what you'd need to do is you're running your um, simulator over there and I'm writing down the tree sequence. And so every time you produce a new individual, a new gamete, I'm gonna add it to the node table because it's a potential node in our trees. And then you're gonna tell me who it inherited from and I'm gonna write that information down in the edge table. And then if there were any new mutations, and remember only selected mutations that occurred in that individual, then I will write those down in the mutation table and site table. Okay, so that's what we'd have to do. So hit uh, next. Um, so uh, this is a terrible idea because it produces way too much data to be useful in practice. Uh, next. Um, but this is more than we're, we actually need, of course, as, as we already talked about. Um, so next. So what we need, again, uh, so what we need is a method to get rid of the stuff we don't need in these tables. So hit the next. Um, so the question is, so given a big tree sequence with information about many individuals, how do we simplify it down to something containing only the history of some subset of them? So that's kind of the key piece that we needed to make this uh, idea work. Um, so hit down twice. Yeah, skip this one. Okay, so um, here's how the method works. You give me a big tree sequence and tell me that, well, that, that you only want the history of, of these particular samples somewhere in the tree sequence. Think of them at the bottom. So I'm gonna go paint those chromosomes in each their own color, and then I'm gonna trace their ancestry back up through the tree sequence. So I'm gonna move back up through the tree sequence, um, you know, copying those colors onto the bits of the parental chromosomes that they inherited from, okay? So that's gonna trace ancestry back up through the tree sequence. And any, anytime I, I copy two colors onto the same place, that's a coalescent event and something we need to output in the, the new tree sequence. And so I'm going to make a node for that individual that the coalescence occurred in, if there isn't one already and output the corresponding information in the edge, in the new edge table. <clears throat> and I know I, <clears throat> and I can tell that I'm done um, because when all the colors have coalesced on a given segment, I don't have to propagate that segment anymore. Okay, so um, could you just step through slowly this next animation of an example of how this process works? but maybe I don't need to, I will not talk through the entire thing. So just hit down until you get to a different picture. So here I have an example of this process happening, tracing the colors back up through a, a small tree sequence and outputting a um, new simplified node and edge table as we go. Um, Okay, so here's another demonstration of this, of how this works. Um, here I've got the tree sequence of, um, so all the trees relating everybody in a right Fisher simulation with overlapping generations of 10 individuals run for 30 generations. Okay, so uh, next. Uh, but say like we only care about how the 10 individuals who are at the end of the simulation are related to each other, you know, because that's like the data that we have. So here's the same tree sequence with just them um, labeled down at the bottom. So if you hit next, uh, we see the same tree sequence simplified down to just the history relevant to those 10 individuals. So that's a visual depiction of like how much extraneous information there is from a forward time simulation and how much you know we get rid of by running this simplification procedure. Okay, uh, right. And down. Okay, so we made this work. Here's how we made this work. Uh, we wrote a bunch of C code um, and Python in MS Prime 
uh, that can do this stuff with tables. So there's some stuff already and we wrote, uh, we generalized it and wrote some more tools, in particular the simplification algorithm. Uh, and it's all designed to be fairly modul modular, so you could use the same stuff to hook up to different simulators, pretty easy. Um, Kevin Thornton went ahead and hooked it up to his um, software for BP. Uh, well, wrote a simulator in his library for BP that is connected to our um, tree sequence stuff using PyBind11 uh, in NumPy. <coughs> And then we benchmarked the results on uh, Kevin's development machine uh, next. And we also have um, two other implementations so far, one in implementing with Simupop and another one um, interfacing with the same code in a different way using Cython. Okay, next. So to benchmark, what we did is we ran some Wright Fisher simulations of Cyzen for 10 n generations. Uh, neutral mutation rate equal to the recombination rate. And, uh, you know, so that this is something you actually need to run a forward simulation for with, uh, we ran it with a whole lot of background selection. So many weakly deleterious, weakly deleterious mutations. So this results in, you know, lots of segregating weakly deleterious mutations at lowish frequency. Um, uh, next. And, so we ran, um, for each simulation, we ran it set up. We, each simulation set up, we ran it two ways. One, the traditional way where we just kept track of the neutral mutations as we went, went along. And the other way where we turned that off but recorded the tree sequences and then put the neutral mutations down afterwards. So um, both ways we ended up with equivalent genome sequence. But the second way we also ended up with the tree sequences, so the genealogies. And in the next figure, the sort of tree sequence recording is called pedigree recording. But um, anyway, so these are the run times. Um, the different lines correspond to different population sizes. Uh, the x-axis is genome size, scaled by number of individuals, because uh, that's sort of the, the unit of how much work when doing one of these it takes. And uh, the left panel gives the sort of traditional method um, where we record neutral mutations. And the, the right panel gives the runtime for our method with recording tree sequences instead. Um, and so just to orient you, everything here is taking an order of hours. Um, there's a lot of points we don't have in the left panel because those were simulations that were too big to run, you know, before uh, without the tree sequence recording. And the biggest simulations here, uh, the rightmost point of the purple line with the circles is a thousand individuals with um, roughly a whole human genome. Uh, the rightmost blue triangle, so this is in the right figure, uh, is 10,000 individuals with something like human chromosome one. And uh, the rightmost like X, with the lime green line is 50,000 individuals with about 50 megabases. Um, and if you go to the next slide, you see the, uh, you know, this is plotting the ratio of those two times for the ones where we could actually run the traditional simulation. What you see is that doing tree sequence record recording is, you know, giving us even more information about the simulation, but speeding things up by a factor of tens. And the, the speed up factor is increasing for bigger simulations. So, uh, you know, going up to factor of 40 or 50 times faster using this um, tree sequence recording idea. <clears throat> okay, uh, next. And you might wonder, because I made a deal about how much memory it takes to store all these things, uh, you might worry about memory, but you can keep memory down as small as you like, um, basically by adjusting the interval that you go through and simplify, so throughout the stuff that you don't need. <clears throat> okay, uh, right. 
down. Okay, so um, so great. We were happy about that. Uh, we implemented it, and it works. Works very well. Um, so currently, all the tools we have are working with tree sequences, and that we hooked up to the Ford's time simulators that are part of MS Prime. Uh, it's a Python package. You can install it with pip. Um, but that's also a coalescent simulator. So really, conceptually, it's um, what we're doing is separating out the tools to deal with tree sequences into TSKit. So soon, that code will be separate in a more modular uh, library to do things like reading in tree sequences, writing them out, iterating over trees, uh, computing statistics very fast along large number of sequences, and simplifying. Uh, so the statistics computation, uh, right now we have Python implementations of how to compute any statistic you can think of pretty much uh, quickly, but um, we're working on translating these things to C to be faster. Uh, next, uh, two, one more. <clears throat> okay, um, no, one up, one back. Okay, and um, of course all of this is working because um, we know we simulated, we, we know the underlying trees because we simulated them. But Jerome is also got a project in process to go through and infer tree sequences with real data. Uh, so he's got this working on large scale data sets to put genomic data into this format and be able to uh, do all these things to them efficiently. And uh, if you're curious, you can see his talk. There's a link to it there on the slides. Okay, um, <clears throat> down. So in summary, tree sequences are compact and efficient ways to store population history along with genome sequence. And I've explained sort of the details of how you encode these, that information in a set of tables that's uh, efficient to use. Um, and I talked about how you can output these, this information during a Ford's time simulation. And it gets you not only the genealogical trees at the end, as well as the genomes, but it also makes can make your simulation tens of times faster. Um, next. So uh, one reason I'm excited about all this is because one direction the field's moving in is um, using machine learning to do inference. Um, you know, because it's applicable to situations where we don't have good analytic results. But the, the key ingredient in doing that <clears throat> is having um, uh, is, is being able to pr provide training data, right? So we need good simulators and that can quickly compute large numbers of genetic statistics. So that those are, those two things are basically exactly what, um, what these tools are helping us do. So one more. Um, and also right now, uh, well, very soon we should have this stuff working in SLIM as well. Okay, uh, right and then down. And this is the last one. So thanks uh, to Jerome, Jamie, and Kevin, and funding and uh, the tools for making these slides. That's all. So thank you very much.